Recently, the mainstream adult animation scene has a very follow-the-leader type mentality. Beyond Adult Swim, there's a whole crop of shows whose sole purpose is to cash in on something else from the same creator or comedian. You still got stuff like Bojack Horseman and The Midnight Gospel that are doing their own weird thing, but this current era is a far cry from the 90s and early 2000s. After South Park was a surprise success, every cable channel wanted to have their own primetime animated shows, and they were willing to give almost anything a shot, only for them all to be cancelled after 13 episodes or less. From this trend, we got cult hits like Mission Hill and Clerks Animated, but the one I hold an unhealthy obsession for is MTV's Clone High, a parody of teen dramas featuring clones of created by Phil Lord and Chris Miller who scored a development deal with Walt Disney Television Animation fresh out of college. Nothing they pitched for the Mouse House went anywhere, including an animated adaptation of The Gap from Outer Space and Super Extreme Mega History Heroes, which featured a fake toy line that marked the first of their many jokes about the Bronte sisters. Together, the Bronte wrote books about confident, independent women. Now they join forces again to become the all-powerful Brontosaurus! During their development deal, they pitched what would become Clone High to Fox and produced for them a nine-minute pilot that has never seen the light of day. It had a completely different art style that I'm not a fan of, and I was not ready for JFK's overrealistic smirk. Lord and Miller's pitch caught the attention of Bill Lawrence, who had just launched the NBC sitcom Scrubs, and with his help, the three of them sold the show to MTV. There's a lot of overlap between Scrubs and Clone High. Nearly all of Scrubs' regular cast members did voice work. It was written, recorded, and designed in the psych ward of the same abandoned hospital where Scrubs was filmed. The nameless janitor was animated into an episode where he was actually given a name. And the very first thing you see in Scrubs is a Clone High t-shirt, one of the few official pieces of merchandise I've ever seen from the series. I started watching Scrubs in preparation for this video, and two and a half seasons in, I said, I can't do this. It's just not my cup of tea. And it was only after attempting to binge it, I found out that Bill Lawrence didn't have much involvement in the actual writing of Clone High. I gotta tell you, it was great uh, finding two young writers and, and really getting to work with them, and, and more than anything else, getting to know, um, Line. Chris Miller and Phil Lord. Chris Miller and Phil Lord. That becomes more clear when you compare the two back to back. The fourth episode of Scrubs ends with a sad montage that I can't take seriously because it's set to a song from the Shrek original soundtrack. Then you watch the fourth episode of Clone High and gee, I wonder what they could be making fun of with this subtle jab. Does a sunset have a soundtrack featuring Smash Mouth? The bulk of this series pokes fun at the cliches of teen dramas of the era, like Beverly Hills 90210 and Dawson's Creek. Every installment is billed as a very special episode, themed around PSA topics or school plot tropes like the student election or prom. They cover a lot of ground in 13 episodes, even if the timeline doesn't make much sense. But that structural confusion is to be expected in a show where there's a homecoming episode that doesn't actually have a homecoming dance. One of my favorite parts of how every episode is bookended is how the narrator constantly teases big twists that the show loves to spit in the face of. And something tragic may or may not happen. Also, his friends call him Pun Dog. My friends call me Pun Dog. Most of the plots are driven by a crazy love triangle between the oblivious and awkward Abe Lincoln, the angsty goth Joan of Arc, and the self-absorbed Cleopatra. Even though the dynamic between these three always hits the same beats, it's oddly compelling because of a small subversion. For much of the show, the nerd is dating the girl of his dreams, and while Cleo often manipulates Abe, he couldn't be happier. Why would he consider dating Joan when he's already going steady with the hottest girl in school? While Joan herself can also be selfish, she's a much better friend to Abe, and goes so far as to help him and Cleo stay together. Thanks, Joan. I'm kissing my girlfriend because of you. Dinger. As awkward and one note as scenes concerning these relationships can be, having pros and cons for both of Abe's potential dates makes this will-they-won't-they they surprisingly complex under the surface. All of the main characters probably didn't need to be clones of famous figures, but the show wouldn't be the same without its historical aspects. When present, these references complement the tongue-in-cheek nature of the comedy. Well, I'm a genetic duplicate of Abe Lincoln, and I'm not fit to be president. If I only knew what fears and insecurities were holding me back. If you're hesitant to watch the show because you're worried that this is a major feature of the humor, just know that the creators were actually told to be more obvious with the references in fear that MTV's audiences would be too stupid to understand them. Now that's a comforting thing to hear from a network.
Be careful with that nail gun, Jesus. Neither the school or the clones are hidden from the public, and the latter even have foster parents that have clearly influenced how their children turned out. However, there's a secret board of shadowy figures keeping tabs on them, with the help of the mad scientist Principal Scudworth. Little do they know I have my own plans for these clones. Plans that don't involve these shadowy figures at all. You're talking in a normal indoor speaking voice. So I am. Scudworth and his robot sidekick, Mr. Butlertron, are voiced by Lord and Miller, and they're the focus of many subplots. Pretty much anything goes with these two, from parodies of sitcoms to Looney Tunes. Scudworth is a classic and competent cartoon antagonist, but I like how he sometimes takes pride in his students, despite scheming to use them for his own evil plans. This duo are clear examples of creator's pets, but they work as a breather from the main stories because they're unabashedly silly. I'll title it! What it's like to be a teenage clone, colon, a rope of sand. Good title, it draws the reader in without giving too much away. I wish that we got to see more of the show's setting, exclamation point, USA. The introduction of Gesh, a rival school with genetically engineered students, makes me wonder what other thinly veiled government projects are out there. I suppose the celebrity cameos technically count as world building, as lots of era appropriate personalities drop by the school's campus. This includes some notable musicians, like the ever timeless pop sensation Ashley Angel from O Town. Wow, he's like the Beatles and Jesus rolled into one. Marilyn Manson has a musical number about the food pyramid, and it would be funnier if it wasn't a sad reminder of how the USDA now considers that nutrition guide obsolete. Now it's just boring circles, which lack an exciting sense of upwards momentum. May the fat segment rest in peace. When you eat your sweets, make sure you try to limit your servings or you'll die. Jack Black guest stars in the rock opera episode Raising the Stakes as my husband Hotel OC, which shares the same inspiration as a banned Powerpuff Girls episode I've talked about before. It's super ambitious and intricate for only being episode 9. It goes so far as to have a number of hidden images and a backwards message, proving that Gravity Falls did not in fact invent the idea of cartoons having secrets. Clearly, it all started here. I am talking backwards and telling you to watch Clone High and for us to get an Emmy. I'm saying that backwards, because it's sneaky. I think raising the stakes might be too strong of a change of pace, because the main subject of parody is radically different than what the other episodes focus on. Maybe it could have worked a little better if the subplot was more down to earth. In spite of its flaws, I still like it a lot. Each scene brings something new to the visual department, and the musical numbers are really catchy and covered in clever lyrics. The sun is raising us to a higher plane. After this line, there's gonna be a refrain! Music is a key component of Clone High's identity. Peppered into its delightfully overdramatic score are licensed songs from indie rock bands of their time. This show featured tracks from Dashboard Confessional, Alkaline Trio, The Get Up Kids, and America and Football. Names that mean absolutely nothing to a musically uncultured youngster like me. They added a lot of texture and authenticity to intentionally overdramatic moments and the rest of the soundtrack matches their energy well enough that I had to double check when a song in the background was specifically written for the show, unless it's painfully obvious. I really gained an appreciation for the soundtrack when some of it was stripped away. Nowadays, if you purchase Clone High digitally or watch it on MTV's website, you'll be watching a rescored version that cuts out all the licensed stuff. This is just one of a few different versions of the series, with the others being the vanilla Canadian version that was released on a now out of print DVD, and a lightly censored American version that was referred to as Clone High USA. The Rescore's replacement tracks don't fit as well, and were hastily edited together, but they're not too noticeable unless you're watching them back to back, or you're watching this scene. Abandoned pools! You got it, Prom King. Speaking of the abandoned pools, this band performed the theme song, and it's the perfect combination of snarky and angsty. Most of its visuals are clips from the early episodes, but there's half a minute's worth of flashy clips resembling pages from a science textbook that I really love. I'm curious to know who or what studio was behind them. Same goes for all the splash cards in between act breaks. Holiday and Sarah McLaughlin inspired versions of the theme were featured in the broadcast versions of episodes 10 and 11 but there also exists a full three-minute version with insightful new lyrics. There's a place that you can go to And it's never very far Famous people you can live through If you don't know who you are Why there's so much to live up to Expectations are so high 
While Clone High is always upbeat or satirical, there is a sense of darkness covering its premise. These clones will never be their own people, and they'll always be in the shadow of their predecessors. It's a clever explanation for why the clones are so different than their counterparts, and have reinvented themselves in struggling to live up to their own legacies. The high school setting is a perfect fit for the story. Nowhere else is there as much pressure for one to figure out who they want to be. A different show might explore the philosophical and ethical ramifications of what it means to be a clone. But this is Clone High, and it's not very interested in doing that. So, religion's for fools, eh? In 2009, John Kay, creator of the groundbreaking cartoon The Ripping Friends, posted designs on his very out-of-touch blog that mocked the look of Clone High. As interesting as it is to see an industry veteran draw hate art, especially since the designer of those characters was a layout artist on four seasons of his own show, this flat, geometric and thickly outlined style was everywhere in the early 2000s after the likes of Dexter's Lab and the Powerpuff Girls made it extremely popular. The trend was inspired by the work of the 50s era animation studio UPA, known for their Mr. Magoo and Gerald McBoing Boing shorts. While it would inspire the looks of many cartoons produced around the turn of the century, Clone High was one of UPA's most faithful successors. It's got plenty of overlapping shapes and colors, limbs are long and noodly, and often I can't tell where the floor ends and a wall begins. The show integrates its own visual language into that distinct style. I'll admit that it's a tad polarizing. Since everyone's eyes are crooked or falling off their faces, there are some unfortunate in-between frames, and sometimes Joan's forehead is also the top of her head. Often you can tell where they took shortcuts, especially in the earliest episodes, where sometimes the main characters do absolutely nothing when they aren't speaking. But I think a lot of the charm in Clone High's animation comes from its simplicity. The snappy poses fit the comedic timing well, and I like how a lot of shots are framed by just showing the character's face or having them slide on screen. So many specific visual details stick out to me just because of how they're animated. Scudworth's curly fingers, the French kissing, JFK's stupid smug smirk, and how everyone expresses sincerity in the same way, by dilating their pupils and raising their hands in unison, usually accompanied by a single tear. Yeah, is that water leaking out of your face? It cracks me up how often this was used, just because of how silly the pose is to begin with. There's so much synergy between the writing and the animation, often with gags involving the double entendre loving womanizer JFK. He's got a mirror right above his bed, so that the first thing JFK sees when he wakes up is himself. His reaction to finger guns also cracked me up when I realized what it was referencing. Imagine my surprise when I found out that the storyboarding and directing was mostly handled by a separate Canadian team after it was written and designed in the United States. It feels like everyone working on Clone High was on the same page, and that's even more impressive when a sizable chunk of the production team was in another country back in 2002. The more I watch cartoons, the more I long for UPA-inspired visuals to make a comeback, especially if these highly questionable tweets of mine have anything to say about it. Just like the parody aspects, the art style is a product of its day, but the creative execution helps it hold up. The creators of Total Drama liked it well enough that they asked their character designer to intentionally rip it off, and it's continued to rip it off to this day across eight seasons over multiple series. How deliciously ironic that a show about clones would have one of its own aspects cloned. Across its 13 episodes, every aspect of the series gets a little stronger. You can tell that the creative team and actors are becoming more in tune with the characters. Everyone appears to have come to the same conclusion. Hearing Will Forte scream as Abe is always funny. Surprise! Ah! You're not my science book! Everything falls into place in my personal favorite episode, Film Fest Tears of a Clone. Every character gets the opportunity to express themselves in ways that perfectly summarize their personalities, even those who had only appeared once or twice beforehand. Oddly enough, I think the worst outing comes right before, in Episode 3, ADD, the last D is for Disorder. It's still laying down the groundwork, but the plots don't feel tailored to the characters. The pilot shares those same qualities, I just think the ADD episode has a few less memorable moments. Also, Tom Green guest stars, so it's instantly dated. Episode 3 is about the school finding out that Gandhi has ADD, and oh, I actually haven't mentioned Gandhi yet. He's an outrageous party animal and probably the best designed character. Gandhi's head is perfectly shaped like a G, and his small stature forces shots to be staged where he meets the heights of the other clones. To job. Gandhi's hijinks are usually relegated to subplots, so in the long run, he didn't have a huge influence on the show. 
on January 30th, 2003, which conveniently happens to be the anniversary of Gandhi's death, political activists in India staged a hunger strike to protest a comic in Maxim magazine that insulted the leader of their country's independence. They also had conveniently found a bio of the Clone High character on MTV's website and decided to also protest the show in front of MTV's headquarters in India. The head of the channel's parent company, Viacom, was conveniently visiting the building on the same day, and the strike trapped him inside. Protesters threatened to revoke MTV's broadcasting license in India if they didn't take Clone High off the air, and India conveniently happens to be a big country. So the show was scrubbed from broadcast, no pun intended, after only eight episodes aired in America. The thing is, this interpretation of Gandhi was inspired by how the original was known to drink and party when he was still in law school, as well as people of Indian descent the creators knew that also buckled under the expectations of their culture. Looking back on it, they admitted that it wasn't the best idea to poke fun at a historical figure that few members of the creative team truly knew the significance of but their intentions with the character were never malicious. The creators planned to send the protesters an episode where Gandhi didn't do anything stupid to show that they portrayed him as a person and not just a joke, but unfortunately they could not find an episode that fit their criteria. How could I be embarrassed by a friend? Pow, 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 pow. who's got the legs? Me, that's who, me. If Gandhi didn't get the show canceled, low ratings would have been its downfall because only one animated series on MTV in the past 20 years has lasted more than one season. Priorities at the network were shifting, and they rejected both pitches for a possible second season of Clone High, one where Gandhi was absent and no one questioned it, and another where it would be revealed that Gandhi was actually a clone of Gary Coleman all along, turning this gag here into accidental foreshadowing. Lord and Miller had plans for how they would structure the next three years of the series' run. In Season 2, the clones would have their memories wiped and would repeat their junior year. Season 3 would be their senior year, and then in Season 4, they would be caught in a time loop that would force them to repeat their junior year again. I love how much backpedaling would be necessary, all because Season 1 didn't start during their freshman year. In the 17 years that followed, Bill Lord and Chris Miller did go on to become two of the most versatile directors in Hollywood, and they might have won a Golden Globe or Academy Award here and there, but all of their recent work is clearly still in the shadow of their low-budget basic cable cartoon. Why else would they work with the same actors, reference its running gags, recycle their own jokes, and even name a key character after one of their old interns? Clearly, it's all been in preparation to bring Clone High back. But what if they weren't the ones to do it? Over the past few years, Ian McGinty hinted that he was working on some sort of continuation of the show in the form of a comic. He worked on the print adaptations of Adventure Time and Rocco's Modern Life, along with creating the pilot Welcome to Showside. Hey look, Donkey Bird's coming for the water again! <laughs> nice. I got in contact with him to ask what became of his revival, and here's what he had to say. I worked on this pitch with writer Kate Leth also a Mega Clone High fan. We were brainstorming how cool a comic series would be as we worked together on the Bravest Warriors comics, and it just seems like a logical next step. A second season, so to speak. The general plan was that a new principal comes in and tries to subvert everything, and the students team up against her and her shadowy team. The main issue is the license. It's unclear who owns it, and so we couldn't secure the rights to do anything but a fan-type thing, which we would've done but wouldn't be paid for, and we both require payment for any projects that aren't extremely personal or for charity. Other than that one page, that's all we did beyond a pitch packet just explaining who we are and what we wanted to do with the comic. Phil Lord did enjoy it, though. I think a comic would have been a great medium to bring the series into, as it lends itself to cliffhanger-heavy stories spread out across a year, especially with those love triangles. If it was still around today, I'm positive that they would be making fun of Riverdale or even 13 Reasons Why. McGinty's comments do bring up a good point. The rights of this show are a tangled mess. Because the original pitch came from Lord & Miller's Disney development deal, they co-own the series with MTV and Nelvana. You would have to threaten, or in other words make a deal, with three separate media conglomerates. Not to mention how Bill Lawrence isn't currently working at the same studio as Lord & Miller. However, not all hope is lost. A couple weeks ago, Lawrence was a guest on the Scrubs Rewatch podcast and had this to say. Are you guys bringing it back in some way, Bill? Uh, I'm not at liberty to discuss that yet, Oh, Zach. I stumbled across something top secret, audience. Now, that can mean a lot of things, but I'm not hearing a no. There's already rumors of Mission Hill making a return, 
and Kevin Smith is getting bored, so he might revive Clerks Animated, because I guess that's just a thing he can do. With how prolific its creators are, Clone High could still get another shot if someone's up to dedicating years of their life to slay all the necessary legal dragons to rescue the rights. It pains me that there's only 13 episodes for now, because the de facto series finale ended on a cliffhanger, and with so many questions left unanswered, chief among them being whatever happened to Pun Dog. My friends call me Pun Dog. Apparently, it was just a nickname for the script coordinator. He went on to write Reanimated, so at least something involved with the show had to happen ending. I still want a reunion movie or a miniseries to provide closure at the very least, along with a slight upgrade to the visuals that keep the look and feel intact. Maybe something like this? I commissioned my good friend and Raising the Stakes detractor Mike Cat SU to reinterpret the show for fun, and besides ignoring my valid criticism, he did a great job adding detail and rounding things out without removing the original's charm. You could argue that the show is better left in the past, but minus a few scattered pop culture references, I think it's aged remarkably well. And I say that as someone who first watched it recently. Hey, you miss an episode, it's your funeral. I'm talking to you, Doug. The self-aware humor feels very modern, and the art stands out today and stands above its contemporaries. So why not give it a second life, much like its cast? I'd hope that any continuation picks right up from where the show left off, because I really liked how the later episodes had signs of it becoming more dramatic. It was obviously still done in the name of parody, but the characters were likable enough that you could still feel for them throughout their gimmicky struggles. As tightly written and visually dynamic as it was, what makes the series so special to me is how it seamlessly blends comedy and genuine drama. It's sort of like a magic trick. It sneaks up on you, and not even the creators can explain how it happened. If you learn to embrace the absurdity of this show, then it will make you laugh and shiver and cry.